Hi, everybody. Um, welcome back to our third panel on ethical issues and COVID-19. Um, but just before we begin, I have to say how deeply moved I was by the depth and quality of our first two panels this morning. Uh, the first panel on healthcare disparities featured Marshall Chin, Monica Peak, Jason Karlowish, and Stacey Lindau. Our second panel on clinical ethics featured Susan Toll, Andrew Hantel, Laura Roberts, Gretchen Schwarzy, and David Schiedemeyer. Uh, also, uh, I, I can't say enough about how Marshall Chin was terrific as the moderator of both panels. Because Peter Hubel had an acute dental emergency, Marshall stepped in graciously and had less than 15 minutes to prepare to moderate that second panel. The speakers were each incredibly articulate, incisive, and effective in their talks. While I love their compliments about my role as their teacher and guide when they were McLean Fellows, the reality is that, that each of them was brilliant and was my teacher. I learned more from them when they were fellows than they learned from me. And, and witnessed by this morning's talks, my learning continues. I'm now delighted to introduce the six speakers uh, on this third panel. Emily Landon, Peter Singer, Kelly Mickelson, Savi Fetson, Karen DiMartino, Erin DiMartino, forgive me, and Lori Zoloth. I encourage members of the audience to write questions in the Q&A section, just as you did for this morning's panels. Let me now begin by introducing our first speaker, Emily Landon. Emily is the Medical Director of Antimicrobial Stewardship and Infection Control here at the University of Chicago. Uh, Dr. Landon is an Associate Professor of Medicine and an Assistant Director of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. Uh, Emily's research focuses on healthcare provider behavior as it relates to preventing healthcare-associated infections. She has become a leading spokesperson both in the state of Illinois and nationally on the COVID-19 pandemic. Emily has appeared on ABC, CBS, NBC, television, and has been quoted widely by, by newspapers like the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, and the New York Times. Today, Emily will speak on the topic, COVID-19, Clinical and Ethical Challenges. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Emily Landon. Emily. Hi, everyone, and thank you for having me, Mark. You know, I know everyone is taking an opportunity to say how wonderful you are, but I would not be here today talking at this conference if it wasn't for all of the times that I came to your office to ask, how am I supposed to make these decisions as the hospital epidemiologist? Who helps you figure out these ethics? And you said, well, you're going to have to do it if you want someone to figure it out. And so I learned in the fellowship, and now I'm able to imagine. And uh, it's your influence in that is huge. And I hope it will help us do a better job, not just with this pandemic, but with everything we do in this aspect of improving things in healthcare to make things safer. So moving forward, though, I do want to talk about um, COVID today. This is kind of a mishmash of, of everything. You know, I think this is a really different time in our lives. And I think many of us, myself included, were, even though I knew it was coming and I knew we would need to shut down our lives and change the way we did everything in order to address this pandemic, it still came as a shock to me how much my life has changed since then. And I bring to you today the importance that we probably need to be temporary closed again. So the most important ethical point, you know, there are so many different ethical things that we can talk about within COVID-19. And it's just every single issue, every single tiny decision brings ethics into the mix. And 
the one overriding piece for me is that justice, something that we strive to keep out of our medical decision making with individual patients, where we are often trying to uh, remove justice and the concerns of justice from our individual decision making, becomes quite literally the most important piece, fairness, justice, the good of the community becomes very important. That's how public health ethics looks at the world all the time. But as this becomes juxtaposed with medical ethics and how we care for individual patients, it can be very difficult to navigate these things. As I said before, there are so many ethical issues and they're very different from the ones, that, well, well, of course, end of life issues and, you know, that and privacy issues are things that we address every single day. There are new ones that are new to all of us that we're finding our way through and trying to make that balance between public health ethics, which seeks to improve the good of the many and the medical ethics, which seeks to improve the good of the patient. Today, I mostly want to make talk about a public service announcement. The current national situation is abhorrent. It is, as some have said, a humanitarian disaster, a COVID hell. Experts have been sounding the alarm about this COVID outbreak resurgence of the fall across the United States. And remarkably, we haven't heard a word from our commander in chief. You can see that right here in the Chicago area is the epicenter, although I would argue that Wisconsin might actually be the epicenter, of a very, very difficult time for everyone in the United States. And the wave of cases just seems to radiate out from us and affect more and more places across the United States. In Chicago, our positivity rate has gone up from a 2 to 3% positivity rate to 15% in the last seven days. There are more than 2,000 cases in Chicago every day. That's the seven-day rolling average. It's unbelievable to me that we have so many people getting sick. I hear many, many arguments from many people about why we shouldn't pay attention to COVID because most of those people won't die because they're, it's just a cold, it's just a flu. All of those are false disinformation and a denial that we hear across the board in the United States. Sorry. I want to talk today a little bit about how we can actually use math and science to help us make sense of the situation. You know, in epidemiology, we use what's called an SIR model or susceptible, infected, or is infectious, and then removed or recovered. And the idea of this model is that every single person in the world can be in one of these three buckets. Now, of course, you can add additional buckets, and then you can, once you know how many people are in them, then you can apply different interventions to try and reduce that bucket or, or sort of slow the throughput through this whole transmission chain. This is the most important piece of everything that we do. We want to get as many people over to that immune or removed bucket as possible. Most importantly, we want to remove them from the infectious bucket. That's why we do things like contact trace and quarantine close contacts. That way, if we put them into isolation or quarantine before they become ill, we can remove them from being infectious in public, which then reduces the number of interactions between infectious individuals and susceptible individuals. This is also why we wear masks. They provide a physical barrier that helps prevent the sort of admixing of the air or the aerosol droplets from infectious people to susceptible individuals. One thing that many people talk about is using herd immunity to get to the end of this very difficult trek across the SIR model. And the reality is that using a vaccine would skip over that infectious group and take us to immune without having so many interactions with infectious individuals. But it's really important to understand that having people take that transit through is what drives deaths, cost, danger to the economy, and a horrific toll on our healthcare system. Increasing the size of that infectious group is the thing that we do not want to do at all costs. 
That infectious group costs money. It costs time. It overburdens hospitals. It endangers high-risk individuals. And it becomes harder and harder to keep the susceptible individuals safe and having less contact with the infectious individuals if we grow that infectious group. This is why a herd immunity strategy is a terrible, horrible idea when it doesn't involve skipping over the infectious group. So I think I wanted to provide you with a little bit of sort of ability to talk about these things in, from an epidemiological way. And this is why there is an, a real ethical and moral calling to reduce the number of infectious individuals because we need to protect the susceptibles. Of course, we will see vaccines coming soon, but in the meantime, what do we do to try and prevent the movement through that infectious period? Well, the most important thing we could do are layer up all of our things. As you know, there's no one perfect mask that will protect anyone. There's no one perfect distance that we can keep all the time. There's no way to completely avoid having to touch any surfaces. And so we have to acknowledge that every single one of the things that we do will have holes in it and will not in and of itself prevent people from getting sick. So instead, we layer them up so that they overlap one another, creating the safety net that we need. The new vaccines that are coming and that we will begin to see in healthcare, probably by the end of December, will be about 50%, maybe more than that, the new information from, the new data from Pfizer sounds like they think that they are going to be 90% effective in their interim analysis. I think that that would be amazing, but it's probably a little overly optimistic for the number of observations that they have for us to actually expect that level of efficacy. But if we add that to this, it is just another layer in our layered approach to harm reduction for the COVID epidemic. And so as we head into the winter and we have this huge outbreak that is rippling across the country, it's so important that you all understand, especially as leaders and healthcare providers, that these Additional vaccines have to be an added layer. Over time, that layer will get thicker, it will get better, it will become less permeable, and we can maybe pull back on some of the other things. But in the meantime, we add vaccines to our masks, to our distance, and all of the other things that we're doing in order to prevent COVID. It's not a replacement for any of those um, interventions. Today, I want to show you a new way of looking at risk that we are adding at the University of Chicago. This is a preview um, of what you, those of you who work at UCM will see next week. So the issue here is that there have been a lot of discussions and you see in the city of Chicago has put out new travel restrictions saying if you travel to one of these higher risk states and you come to, you know, come back to Chicago, there are certain things you have to do. We've decided that it's much more important as we see 10 to 20 healthcare workers getting sick with COVID every single day at the University of Chicago, not from patients, but from high risk activities in the home or outside of work. We've decided that it's much more appropriate to do a risk based strategy. So we're going to ask employees who undertake these high risk activities to use vacation time or paid time off to quarantine for seven days afterwards, including for the Thanksgiving holiday. And some of you will look at the high risk list, list and think, oh my God, I cannot do that. These are things that I'm doing right now. I strongly recommend that anyone who is working in an area or living in an area where COVID is on the rise, that you need to avoid everything in the high risk category. We provided a lower risk category in order to help everyone understand how to do these things without being high risk. So just a quick run through here, eating and drinking indoors with people you don't live with is highly risky. Ventilation systems inside of buildings and homes in America has been made so efficient that it's wonderful at keeping in warm air in order to avoid having uh, losing energy to the outdoors and using too much energy. Unfortunately, that also traps COVID. And that means that you, if you have your mask off, the droplets from your mouth in the dry air of winter, even heated dry air, can spread much further than six feet. And so it's not just the people that you come that are with you and sitting at your table, but also the people across the room. And as time goes on without masks on, that risk gets higher and higher. 
when you have unmasked contact with other individuals, that becomes part of your bubble. So anytime you're in a room with other people that don't have their mask on, that is a risk uh, that you should consider that person part of your bubble and your bubble probably should this this number we have here of five is probably too high for right now so unmasked contact with more than five people that's over an entire week not at one time but total of five people unmasked that you don't live with is pro is way too many i think right now we should probably be sticking with just our housemates and maybe one or two other people total Working out indoors when you can't both keep distance and wear a mask is not safe. Singing or chanting when you can't both wear a mask and keep distance is not safe. Attending crowded outdoor gatherings where people are unmasked, not safe. And traveling without wearing both a mask and eye protection in case someone else removes their mask, also not safe. It may feel to you like these are very onerous restrictions and how can we ask care world to do things like this. Well, we kind of have to, and I understand how you feel. There is a lot of denial going around. These are obviously the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of grief and have also been applied to change. But this pandemic represents a big loss for all of us. Each and every one of us have lost something, whether it's just the opportunity to do something that we wanted to do. Maybe it is a science fair, like my son was very disappointed to not have. Maybe it's the opportunity to be in school with friends. Maybe it's the opportunity to participate in activities one loves. Maybe it's the opportunity to see your parents or your grandparents or your children. But the reality is that this is a loss just like the loss of any other human life. And we need to mourn it, but we also need to move forward. We can allow ourselves to have some denial, some anger, some bargaining, some depression, but at some point we need to make our way towards acceptance. Of course, there will be bad days where we don't feel like we can really do it, where it feels like too much. But you have to be, you have to acknowledge in your, my experience at least has been as a human being, that I have to acknowledge when I'm feeling denial, anger, bargaining, depression, when I have COVID fatigue, and make a conscious decision not to let that become a replacement for my own personal risk assessment. And the same is true of all of our patients. Right now in healthcare, we are the only people standing up for what's right. Obviously, there are many others that are helping us, but we are the voice of reason in a complete vacuum of silence. And it is, in my opinion, our moral and ethical responsibility to speak out, tell the truth, and to help as many people as we can to find their way from denial and anger to a place of acceptance where we can work together to get through the next months. These will be very dark days indeed. The newest models enter, uh, suggest that we won't reach our peak until late January, that numbers could just continue to skyrocket upwards unless we do something different, already doing quite a bit. In other words, we have a long way to go and it's incumbent upon all of us to work together to make that road as smooth as it can be and to remember that even though in March everyone clapped and shouted and flashed their lights and called healthcare workers heroes, that even if they do not say these things today, you are all heroes. Everyone listening to this talk and everyone here and all the people in hospitals and in clinics across America, across the world, who are caring for patients right now, who are trying to help their friends understand that a mask is essential, they and we are all heroes and we need to use that status to help others come along with us. Thanks everyone and good, I'm sorry I won't be able to be at the panel at the end today, I do have other commitments today, but I also wish all of you the best of luck and all the best that can come and hopefully we'll see each other again next fall in person. Emily, um, can you hear me? Thank you so much yes. for the lovely talk. What is your thought on when we will stop seeing a rise in cases per day um, and some, somehow reach a stabilizing point? Even a stay-at-home order at this point would probably, I, I think there probably will be a stay-at-home order coming soon in Chicago, and there probably should be in many other states. Whether or not there will be, I don't know. But I'm not sure that that's going to be enough 
it really comes down to individuals having groups of people in their homes and thinking that six feet is enough, thinking that they can take that barbecue that they did last summer outside indoors and just recreate it, but with six feet of distance indoors, and that's not working. We also are seeing additional sort of increasing deaths again as well. Obviously, there's new evidence now that masking actually reduces, having worn a mask reduces the likelihood that you'll have severe illness if you do get infected. So it's important to wear masks, but oftentimes people are having unmasked contact indoors. And the Thanksgiving and Christmas and, and other holidays that are coming up um, really uh, are pulling on the heartstrings of every American and encouraging them to do things that are not in our best interest as a society or in our best interest for our health. The largest economic um, burden that we carry is the health loss that we've had. And that is going to continue. In other words, I don't see a stop to this until we get vaccine, vaccines widely available, which is many months away, the weather changes or people begin to understand. There will probably be a turning point where people begin to follow these rules, but I'm not sure how many people it will take. Thank you so much. Th thank you. And we, we deeply appreciate your being here. Um, I, I encourage the, um, the audience again to please send their questions um, uh, as, as the talks go on uh, through the Q&A section. Um, let, let me introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker uh, is one of our early fellows, Dr. Peter Singer. Uh, Dr. Singer is now special advisor to the Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Adenom uh, Gibri Ayas, Isis. Uh, Dr. Singer serves as the Assistant Director General of the World Health Organization. In this role, Peter Singer supports the Director General to transform the WHO into an organization sharply focused on impact at the multi-country level. Before joining WHO, uh, Peter Singer co-founded two innovative results-driven social impact organizations. From 1996 to 2006, Peter was the Sun Life Financial Chair and Director of the University of Toronto Joint Center for Bioethics, who some of us believe may be the largest center in North America. And from 2008 to 2018, Peter was Chief Executive Officer of Grand Challenges Canada. Peter is also, was also Professor of Medicine at the University of Toronto and Social Scientist at the University Health Network. Um, uh, Peter had trained uh, with, with me um, and with Al Feinstein at Yale for, for three years before returning to Toronto. In 2011, Peter was appointed Officer of the Order of Canada, the highest award in Canada for his contributions to health research and bioethics and for his dedication to improving the health of people in developing countries. Today, Peter's talk will be on COVID-19 and the World Health Organization. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Peter Singer and don't forget to submit your questions. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you so much, Mark. It's uh, terrific to be with all of you. It's like coming home. And uh, let me start, Mark, with a note of appreciation for you. I'm really looking forward to tomorrow's session, but it's just amazing to see that you've uh, trained 488 fellows, maybe more by now, and uh, that's an incredible legacy. So um, in these times when we're all uh, feeling a little bit isolated, uh, that's something that connects us all, and, and I think many of the people on this, uh, on this uh, webinar, and, and really just wanted to start with expressing appreciation for you. We'll have a chance to do that, I think, in more depth tomorrow, but uh, just wanted to uh, start on that note. Um, I have a very simple message, actually, because it builds very nicely on that wonderful talk that Emily just gave. I fully agree with her. I mean, my message is that ethics uh, and ethical values suffuse most of the, uh, all of the elements of the COVID response, the COVID-19 response, and foremost amongst all those values is justice. 
uh, and at the same time, the practical approach that's been taken um, at the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics is, is very useful and applicable. Um, so uh, I want to um, just really offer a way of thinking about uh, the COVID response. Uh, and, um, and I'll highlight some of the ethical values along the way, but most of them actually, the, the one that really rises to the top is, is justice. And one other one that I'll come to in just a moment that I think actually may trump, uh, trump everything, supersede everything, shall we say. Um, before I go further, let me just say that my uh, Twitter handle is at Peter A. Singer, and it would be great to stay in touch with uh, many of you at Peter A. Singer. Um, if you follow me now, I'll follow you back and we'll have a chance to have uh, some greater connectedness even after this uh, couple of days. At the beginning, though, let me start by saying a bit where we are. We're in a bit of a Churchillian moment, as people were mentioning. Uh, cases are rising. Sadly, um, there have been uh, 51 million, uh, 52 million cases reported globally to the World Health Organization and uh, almost 1.3 million deaths worldwide. I think it's appropriate that we maybe just start with uh, a moment of silence um, reflecting on uh, those people who've died uh, because uh, this is the biggest humanitarian tragedy really, uh, the biggest global health tragedy in 100 years and probably one of the biggest global tragedies since the second war. So let's just pause, uh, if you will join me in a moment of silence. And on behalf of the World Health Organization, I'd like to extend my condolences to the families of those who have lost loved ones. Thank you. I think the other thing I'd like to do is on behalf of the World Health Organization, just extend uh, appreciation and respect to the health workers um, in the United States and around the world who've put themselves in harm's way to serve their communities. And in fact, all essential health, all essential workers, as Emily was saying, you know, uh, health workers constitute about two to 3% of the global population and about 14% of the COVID-19 cases, which shows you the um, undue or extra risk that's taken on by by health workers often to serve their, their communities. And they really merit our uh, respect and appreciation. So let me then just cover the uh, one way of thinking about the COVID response. You know, at the very foundation of the COVID response is actually a type of soft infrastructure of values. And the principal value is the value of solidarity. In more than 115 news conferences since January of this year, uh, Dr. Tedros, my colleague and friend, um, has been emphasizing the importance of global solidarity. That's how the world defeated smallpox, which killed more than 300 million people in the last century, more than all the wars combined at the height of the Cold War, with the United States working closely with the Soviet Union and with other countries and with the World Health Organization. That's how we will defeat COVID, with solidarity. And even though the cases are rising now and there's an incredible devastation of lives and livelihoods, and we might be at our darkest moment, um, there is hope. And I'll come to that. It's the, it's the vaccine news and, and the, the exit from this uh, pandemic is really uh, in our hands. And I hope that we never lose hope uh, because that's so important. So the soft infrastructure here is the value of solidarity. And that's one, that's the bedrock of the whole response. And it's quite interesting that the bedrock of the response is solidarity, it's justice, it's leadership, it's trust between communities and governments. Those are all soft ethical values. And yet without them, nothing else matters in this response. Sitting on that very important foundation of values really are the public health fundamentals. And at the heart of those public health fundamentals are uh, testing, isolating cases, tracing and quarantining contacts. The only way any country has really been able to keep the uh, epidemic or the pandemic under control is just that, through a very robust system of testing, isolating cases, contact tracing and um, quarantining contacts. And of course, caring for cases and contacts who are in isolation or quarantine. That should be accompanied by masking, physical distancing, washing your hands, staying at home when you're sick, 
and um, avoiding uh, poorly ventilated indoor spaces. And as a type of last resort, uh, restrictive measures or so-called lockdowns, but that is really the last resort. And unfortunately we are resorting to that and we probably do need to, uh, to tamp down the virus as uh, Emily was saying, but the heart of the response is um, to use a Canadian metaphor, putting the virus in the penalty box through the testing, the isolation of cases and the quarantining of contacts. Now, um, underlying this aspect of the response is also equity and justice. And to take a concrete example, um, in Toronto, the public health agency, the public health authorities in Toronto have started to look at inequities in the response and have been able to show that racialized communities have higher test positivity rates, um, which of course means that the disease is is running more uh, more rampant. And just one little example on the public health side of how justice and equity has come to play. So we have the bedrock of values, solidarity. We have the public health fundamentals, and there's a lot of uh, uh, inequities being disclosed and uh, shone a light on in the public health uh, arena. And then sitting on top of that is the new scientific tools. That's drugs, that's vaccines, that's diagnostics. We did have some uh, good news this week on drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics. And in particular, with the announcement of the first interim early in a news release, positive results of one of the vaccines. This was an RNA-based vaccine against the spike uh, protein as its target. And it was the Pfizer-BioNTech news. Um, and it's probably good news for Pfizer and the BioNTech and the specific vaccine, but it's also good news for vaccines in general, in a sense, uh, as um, Tony Fauci was saying in the media, it validates the target of the spike protein. It validates the RNA-based platform. Um, and there, there is no RNA-based vaccine on the market now, so that validation is important. Um, what I want to say about vaccines is they're not a silver bullet. We'll need to continue the public health measures through the vaccine period, into the vaccine period, and after the vaccine period. Um, uh, the uh, WHO has led the development of something called the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator, which aims to accelerate the development of these new scientific tools, but also ensure their equitable distribution. So safety and efficacy are very important, and WHO will only um, stand behind a vaccine that it believes is safe and efficacious, and that's important for building vaccine confidence. And equitable distribution is important. There's some uh, modeling work that I think is done um, uh, from a university right in the Chicago area that shows uh, that you can essentially drastically cut death rates through equitable allocation of a vaccine globally, um, leading us to say, that it's better to distribute the vaccine to some people in all countries rather than all people in some countries. In fact, it cuts the death rate, the deaths averted in the modeling studies at least almost in half, which is a remarkable um, outcome from uh, simply an equitable allocation scheme. And of course, uh, WHO has been developing with its member states an equitable allocation scheme focusing initially on health workers and those most vulnerable, those at highest risk, those at highest risk of death. So um, there's a lot that WHO is doing in this area of the new scientific tools and equity is first front and center in uh, many, of these, uh, many of these considerations. So on top of the bedrock of values like solidarity sits the public health fundamentals and on top of the public health fundamentals sits the new scientific tools solidarity and equity being key values throughout. Um, and sitting on top of that, and something that is a little bit early to start thinking about in great depth, is the issues of the recovery, so-called building back better. Now, this can be a slogan unless it really means something. What can it really mean? I'd encourage us to focus in the context of uh, the recovery on um, primary health care which is access to uh, essential services, but it's also empowered communities and multi-sectoral action. And it has a very, very strong focus on equity. I'd like to encourage us to think about how the global challenges we face in health, but not only in health, also in climate, in uh, inequity, um, and the range of global challenges we face in financing the SDGs where we're slipping behind 
um, these challenges converge and we should deal with them in a convergent way. And here I'd also like to say that uh, uh, COVID-19 is obviously a crisis of not only lives, but also livelihoods. There was one estimate published uh, by Larry Summers that the price tag of COVID-19 for the United States was $16 trillion. And compared to that type of money or the more than $10 trillion in stimulus spending, the gap, the financial, the immediate financial gap of $3.8 billion in the ACT accelerator that I described, the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator, is actually very good value for money. So I'd like to encourage us all um, to, uh, to push on, on closing that gap because that's what will yield the um, uh, equitable distribution of vaccines around the world. And also, in addition to that lifeline, a type of insurance policy for uh, um, high income countries where they have access to a portfolio of vaccines. So in the recovery, the last point I wanna make is there's really only one way to solve the economic crisis, and that's by solving the public health crisis. So primary health care with a focus on equity uh, the convergence of global challenges and solving the public health uh, crisis through the solving solving the economic crisis through solving the public health crisis. And again, um, COVID-19 is a very cruel virus. It's shone a very harsh light on the inequities, the pre-existing social and structural inequities in our societies. And uh, we see that coming out in all kinds of ways. If you uh, have a look at the Twitter thread I mentioned at Peter A. Singer, I just retweeted a very nice thread from uh, a colleague at Harvard Medical School who was focusing in on this issue of inequities and gives several great uh, and important and sad examples of, uh, of, of inequities. So um, in closing, uh, I would like to just back to where I began I'd like to appreciate the work that all of you do in ethics, ethics in respect to COVID-19 and more generally. Ethics is at the very heart of uh, the COVID-19 response. It's the foundation of the COVID-19 response. And I've tried to illustrate that in the talk. Solidarity, equity are actually the values on which the whole response is built. They are inherent in the public health fundamentals. They're inherent in the issue of allocation of vaccines, drugs, and diagnostics. They're inherent in the recovery agenda with primary health care and how we build back in a different way um, with, greater, uh, with greater equity. Um, and uh, they're inherent in the whole thing. So the work you do is so important. I'd like to thank you for that. And I'd like to thank uh, you, Mark, for enabling the work that we all do um, and look forward to uh, appreciating that in greater detail um, tomorrow. I would just like to end with one word, and that's hope. It may seem like a very dark time in the coming weeks and months, and in fact, it is a dark time in the coming weeks and months, but there is hope. Um, we're getting the early signals from the vaccine portfolio. We see countries who've been able to uh, control COVID-19 with only the public health fundamentals. Um, and uh, please maintain that hope because the world defeated smallpox, the world will defeat COVID-19. How will we do that? We will do that together. Thank you very much. And I look forward very much to the discussion period and to hearing the comments of all the other speakers. Thank you so much. Peter, thank you so much for the beautiful talk. Um, it was extremely moving. And, um, and and th thank you again. It, 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 we, we look to the panel discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there'll be questions from, um, from panelists and, and from the uh, attendees at, at, in the audience. Uh, let me now introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Kelly Mickelson. Uh, Dr. Mickelson is the Julia and David Uline Professor of Bioethics and Medical Humanities at Northwestern University's Fine School of Medicine, and is also the director of the Center for Bioethics and Medical Humanities there at Northwestern. Uh, Dr. Mickelson is professor of pediatrics at Northwestern and an attending physician in the Division of Pediatric Critical Care at the Lurie Children's Hospital, as well as the director of the Institute for Health and Medicine. For the past eight months since March, 
Kelly has been the chair of the Chicago Bioethics Coalition, which is an organization of more than 50 or 60 ethics experts in the Chicago area who focus on the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Mickelson completed her ethics fellowship here at the McLean Center in 2010, and today she will speak to us on collaboration from crisis. We are all in this together. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Kelly Mickelson. Kelly. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, and I, I'd like to start by joining others in congratulating you on your award. Um, I am incredibly grateful to you and to the McLean Center. I would not be where I am today if it wasn't for you. And so thank you very much and congratulations, such a well-deserved achievement. Um, okay, we're going from the World Health Organization to here in Chicago. And I love the theme of solidarity because I um, hope that this story will be a story to show the value of solidarity. I think that we have seen and heard and felt some of the major challenges that COVID-19 has presented. But I think many would agree that despite all the challenges, there are some silver linings. Um, I once started a class by asking people, what are the good things that have come into your life as a result of COVID-19? And I hear things like new pets, an opportunity to spend more time with my family because I'm staying at home with them. Uh, for me, one of the benefits, one of the silver linings, I would say, of COVID-19 has been this group. So I'm going to give you a story about how we came together and some of the accomplishments of this group and values in Saudi here in Chicago. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about how our group formed. Um, talk about some of the value that I see in the interest in this in interinstitutional collaboration. I'm going to touch a little bit on some of the challenges that we've faced as a group in terms of what to do with some of the issues that have come up for us, um, and then think for a bit about the future of our group. So um, I'm going to start by refreshing the timeline in our minds. And I do this because I just feel like the context of where this group started is important. So if we remember, it was the end of December when we heard reports from China about a new disease emerging. And then um, just a few weeks later, we would hear about the first case of uh, COVID-19 here in the United States. By the end of the month, the World Health Organization had declared a global health emergency, and everyone was well aware of the COVID-19 situation and the concerns about the pandemic. I put up here the date, March 11th, the day the NBA shut down, not because I'm a basketball fan, but because I feel that um, that really marked the time for me when I could when I could sense the huge change and shift. Every time I would turn on my computer and open my email, there would be another conference that got canceled or another issue that was changing. And I think that there, that there was right at this time that sense of impending um, concern. And it became clear also at this time that there were going to be a number of challenges that we would all face and that many of them would be ethical challenges. So I had been at this same time um, working on a, a meeting with some of my colleagues at Northwestern and said to them, gosh, do you think it would be helpful to talk with some other folks around Chicago about some of the issues that it seems like we're all going to be faced with? Um, and of course, there was uh, interest in this. So I sent a few emails out to about three or four colleagues around the city of Chicago to ask if there was interest. And not only was there interest, but the interest in my mind was um, overwhelming. I think I sent the email out on a Monday 
And by that Friday, um, we would be having a meeting with over 40 people from across the Chicagoland area. The stay-at-home order, just to give you a, a sense again for the for what was happening in the world at the time, or the, our location at the time, um, the first stay-at-home order uh, in the U.S. came in California on March 19th. The first meeting of our group was the day after that, and then the following day um, here in Chicago, or in Illinois, what, the stay-at-home order um, also uh, in our state. And then relative to what this group would do is the context of what would happen over the next few months. Um, just a few weeks, we would see the peak, the first peak, unfortunately, we have to say the first, but the first peak of cases in Washington State. Uh, by, by, about, uh, by the beginning of April, we'd see the first peak of cases in New York State. And then um, it wouldn't be until almost a month after this group started to get together that we would get Illinois guidelines for hospital preparedness. And all this while we were seeing what was happening in Washington, we were seeing what was happening in New York and the challenges that the hospital faced and all of us working together to think as a group about how we would face those challenges here in Chicago. Um, and it would be then about two months after this group started to work together that we would see the peak number of the first peak number of cases here in Illinois. So um, what is this group? Uh, as Mark mentioned, we're about 40, 50, it's hard to know, individuals representing at least 13 healthcare systems, largely in Chicago, though we have folks across Illinois and even in some of our meetings have had people uh, from other states across the country. We have virtual meetings. We have an, a very active email listserv where people can post new questions, share new information, um, and even an online presence. We've worked some with the bioethics.net site, which is a uh, moder which is um, managed by Craig Klugman here in Chicago, as well as the, the Northwestern Center for Bioethics and Medical Humanities has a site on our page um, for the group. I think that the major value in our group has been efforts to share and collaborate. And the sharing has been in a variety of ways and situations, whether it's educational materials about public health ethics, about COVID ethics, about um, the COVID, uh, vi the SARS-CoV-2 virus itself, um, a lot of knowledge sharing. We are so fortunate here in Chicago to have a deep fund of knowledge in bioethics in all areas at different institutions um, to share that and their experience, a real way to form connections. And I hope that some of the things I'll show you that have come out of this group will in reinforce that. Um, and again, this sort of website presence. Um, not surprisingly, the topics of conversation have at least initially really focused on allocation of critical care resources and policy development around those resource allocation issues, as well as DNAR policies, CPR policies, which were required in some cases as uh, in part uh, related to those policies. We talked a lot about hospital visitors and visitation restrictions. As the pandemic has unfolded, we've been discussing um, distribution of medications. Uh, vaccine development and distribution is becoming a new uh, important topic of our group research during the pandemic and um, uh, even managing outpatient clinics. But as I noted at the beginning, the issue of allocation was very front and center because of what we were seeing uh, in Washington and New York and concerns that there would be a need to ration. And I use this as an example of uh, some of the some of the issues that we've talked about, but all of also some of the product that has come from this group and some of the challenges that we've faced. So at some point during our conversations, um, Dr. Gina Piscatella and Dr. Will Parker put together this table about the protocols that different hospitals had been put together 
around this issue, and I'm not going to go into the details, that would be a uh, another talk in and of itself. But what I want to point out is that when we looked at the different schemes and compared two different patients, what became very clear was that it depended on uh, which hospital you went to, what kind of resources you might get. So in this case, if you were a 65-year-old and you went to hospital one and two, you would get a particular resource. But if you were the 45-year-old, and uh, you wouldn't get that resource unless you went to hospital uh, three and four. And this issue really came to the fore of the discussion among the group that um, there was an enormous amount of inconsistency about these policies. And I think in part, this is what spurred uh, Dr. Piscatello and Dr. Parker and others to write about it. And so what I want to highlight here is some of the scholarly output that's um, already come from this group and that is on the way uh, as we look forward. So this work uh, by Gina has been, I think, really um, uh, in incredibly important in highlighting some of these inconsistencies across our country. Other work um, has recently been accepted by um, a journal, uh, by this uh, members of this group, as well as future collaborations. And then not just has this group been focused on academic scholarly productivity, but I think really noteworthy is the focus on um, connecting with the community outside the academic world. And to highlight that, I am going to show you some examples of writings of this group in the lay press. This came out by, as you can see, a group, uh, a, a group that came from different institutions across the city of Chicago that was really spurned by this notion that we want the public to know and hear what's going on uh, that may help them feel more comfortable. Um, Dr. Rupali Gandhi and Dr. Angira Patel uh, wrote about um, this issue of ventilator and resource allocation. Uh, Dr. Dahlia Feldman uh, published something about the issues of COVID in pediatrics. Dr. Aaron Paquette was um, really forward thinking in the impact of social distancing on health disparities, um, others about resource allocation. And just to end by highlighting this piece um, by four of the people in this group commenting on some of the worries that we've identified as a group that, uh, that come uh, as a result of inconsistencies and um, challenges with distribution and coordination of resources in Chicago. We've seen a lot of the challenges in Chicago related to disparities of certain populations. And one of the topics that was really front and center in this group was how do we engage the community? We saw in um, Gina's work that uh, of those guidelines that exist in the United States for resource allocation, only half of the ones that she was able to identify reported community involvement. Um, and uh, just a small fraction recommended community involvement, but didn't state whether they had. And this was something that the group talked about and thought about a lot. How can we really engage with the community? Um, one thing we did try to do was engage with an organization called MapCorps that has a connection with University of Chicago and Dr. Lindo, who we've already heard from earlier today. Uh, the idea here was to have conversation with youth about some of the ethical challenges in COVID-19 and get their views. And we hope that this will be something that we can continue going forward. So I mentioned thinking about some of the challenges and the fact that we had recognized a lot of inconsistency across the hospitals in Chicago related to policy. And I think this issue has um, created some challenges among this group. You can imagine a group of bioethicists getting together and identifying sort of uh, an injustice and really feeling the need and obligation to mitigate that injustice in some way, shape, or form. And I think that this group has and continues to struggle with how can we leverage the group to advance 
policy and issue that we think can promote justice? Um, and where's our space to do that? Where's our authority? And how's the best way to do that? We are a group of many different people from many different institutions. We each have individual identities as citizens, as professional identities, as clinicians or bioethicists or other roles that we carry, as well as um, connections to our institutions. And all those things have to be balanced as we try to think about approaches to move all of this forward, particularly when we identify something that um, maybe we don't agree with or we think there's another solution for. So I see that as a challenge. Almost reminds me a little bit of, you know, what is the role of the, the ethics consultation in the clinical setting to impact change? I think maybe there's some parallels there to what is the role of our group in impacting change or helping the society, the culture, the world um, deal with some of these challenging issues. Um, so where are we now? Uh, we moved kind of to monthly meetings, but I feel like as our world is changing again and we're seeing an uptick in cases here in Chicago and across the country, there seems to be some thirst for a little bit more connection and that may change. Um, we certainly are continuing to discuss issues related to COVID and vaccine, for example, vaccine distribution. Um, but I think there's been interest in expanding the focus of the group, not to focus not just on COVID-19 issues, but other issues and things like electronic pulse in Illinois have come up and some other things. Uh, to use possibly this group as a work in progress, an opportunity for people to share their research for further multi-institutional discussion. And really, I think um, the sky's the limit and we'll see where this collaboration can go. And um, I just want to stop at, or end here with some acknowledgements. And I, I can't even list all the people that have been involved in this work. But what I would like to say is how honored um, and humbled I've been to be able to be involved and to work, to learn, um, and sort of to try to, to create change with such an extraordinary group of people. I really do think that this collaboration does demonstrate the value of solidarity uh, that we heard uh, can help the world and I think can also possibly help us here in Chicago. So Thanks to everyone who's been involved in the, this group and thank you to Mark for inviting me to share all of this with you and with everyone during this seminar. Thank you so much, uh, Kelly. Um, it's a great honor that, that a McLean graduate from the fellowship uh, is the director of the COVID-19 Chicago, Chicago Bioethics Coalition and that perhaps a dozen or 15 other members of, of that program uh, are also uh, from the club. Uh, uh, thank you for a lovely talk. Um, and you, you'll be with the panel. I uh, now want to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sebastian Fetzen. Um, uh, Dr. Fetzen uh, is an associate professor in the Center of Medical Ethics. Baylor University, uh, Baylor College of Medicine, and is also an attending and associate professor in cardiology at the Michael DeBakey uh, Medical Center. Um, Dr. Fetzen is an advanced heart failure transplant cardiologist, and before her move to Texas, worked here at the University of Chicago, with then the busiest heart transplant center. In Illinois. Um, Savi also is a McLean Fellow. Uh, she's been a speaker at national and international heart failure, transplant, and bioethics meetings on topics such as end of life, ethical dilemmas in heart transplant candidacy, and candidacy and mechanical circulatory support. Today, Dr. Fetzen will speak to us on experimentation in a time of crisis, control trials, or case reports. Please join me in giving a warm welcome uh, to Savi Dr. Sumitri Fetzen on her return to Chicago uh, by, by Zoom. Savi. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, thanks to the McLean family for the continued support of the center and to my colleagues. Uh, this was always my homecoming time to Chicago. Um, I would also just, I, I did the math this morning and I've known Mark for 96% of my life now. Um, so we go back a ways and it's really thrilling uh, for me to be here. And I um, really appreciate the, the opportunity to talk about some thoughts I've had about the role of sort of scientific inquiry in the setting of a pandemic. And there are many lights, um, sort of issues that come, that come up in this setting that we have to think about um, in the setting of a pandemic. So I am now at the Texas Medical Center, which is the largest medical complex in the world. And uh, it's interesting following that, that wonderful talk, we at the Texas Medical Center have also set up a ethics consortium in part to address the hospital shopping so that we actually manage to create consensus among all the hospitals here so that if you went to one hospital as a patient, you would be f certain of getting the equivalent care or the equivalent level of care as at other hospitals. So I think it's interesting that uh, groups of bioethicists have gotten together in different settings and have done that. Um, so we've also at the at Baylor come up with a um, scientific review committee for studies and to really offer guidance to the IRB to think about prioritization of studies, not only for um, the quality of the study and priority to get through the IRB, but also to think about if you have a limited number of patients, what studies perhaps these patients should be directed to, uh, these studies the patient should be directed towards. Um, so looking at, again, some of the very different aspects, I think, of ethics that the pandemic has brought to light. So in medicine, we are really governed by the rule of rescue, um, the desire to do something, to try new therapies, to find uh, um, new purposes of old therapies, to save the dying patient in front of us with little regard to cost. Um, and I think when we, when we think about costs, they're the obvious financial costs, they're the resource costs that all of us have become familiar with, with COVID and the pandemic, and just ventilators and ECMO and staffing and beds and all of the, the sort of physical costs that take into it. But I think these are just some of the costs that we think about in the setting of the care of patients under COVID. And I think also in the ethics of research in the setting of a pandemic. And I think that we have to think differently about how we might need to approach this. So by springtime, as you've heard the, the timeline that was just, we were all reminded of, you know, we had a global health emergency. Um, COVID had spread well beyond China, was spreading through Europe, and we were in search of a cure, or at least in search of things to attenuate the disease. So we had a disease for which we needed to find things to do. So we were faced with a challenge of wanting to do something, do something to take care of the patients in front of us, to sort of stamp up this disease. But we were also counterbalanced with the desire for the pursuit of scientific knowledge to understand this new yet similar respiratory virus that we were facing. But this graph is not the graph of COVID cases, although it looks like it. No, this is a graph of the PubMed citations. If you just look at searching up COVID-19 and treatment from January, 2020 until last week. So just taking COVID alone, there've been over 70,000 published works within the past year. Related to COVID and treatment, there have been 1,900 cases or publications showing just the determination and the urgency of the, and the need and the desire to get answers about what to do so we could do something. So the case reports are nearly 4,000. 4,000, unfortunately, not all peer-reviewed or adjudicated but published. And I think this is important because with this exponential explosion of information and publication, they've come retractions, some of them fairly prominent, uh, prominent journals. And I think this is, this is an entire talk to itself about the responsibility of the scientific community to maintain peer standards and peer adjudication. But if you just look at the numbers of retracted studies related to COVID, this year it's been 35. If you look, and that's just 2020. If you look at all of the published literature on HIV, there have only been 100 retracted studies. Hepatitis C, 34. 
Influenza, 45 retracted studies. SIRS, one. And for Ebola, which absolutely had a higher fatal case fatality rate, there are no retracted studies because you didn't have this churning out of information. Um, one could argue that was very local, wasn't a global pandemic, absolutely. But it's interesting to think about how we have to address some of the sort of responsibility and the ethics of getting all of this information out. So we have a rush of excitement and perhaps some misdirection. So how can, how can we try and balance our wants and our desire to do something, our, you know, the rule of rescue um, related to the pursuit of scientific inquiry. Part of this dates back to the Belmont Report. And since, since the sort of scathing release of the Belmont Report, we have classically separated scientific research and clinical medicine. And the reasons for this, you know, the myriad reasons and the benefits I think have been fairly obvious, you know, protect the human subjects, make sure that the research is of good quality and for beneficence, justice, although that's arguably been the case in the, in the selection of study subjects. I think those are clearly the benefits, but there've been burdens associated at least with the gold standard of scientific inquiry, which is randomized controlled trials. You have the burdens of randomization. You have the practical aspects of, you know, how do you order a drug versus a placebo and getting a research pharmacist involved. You have the fact that many of these are only done in limited academic or very sort of advanced or larger community settings, and therefore you are necessarily excluding access to studies from the very subjects from whom we could gain a great deal of information. And certainly in the setting of this pandemic, we know that these are people who are at higher risk for having higher healthcare burden of this disease. So I think that part of the problem about the way scientific research has has tried to push towards the randomized controlled trial has led to some of the problems that we have um, right now in the, in the pandemic. Because we have a hierarchy of research design. You know, we have at the very, the very top, the randomized controlled trial. And if you have one or two randomized controlled trials, you have a level of evidence to A for any guideline recommendation you make. This is really what we're looking for. And so going down sort of the, the cascade, we have prospective non-randomized, somewhat less worthy cohort case controlled and then perhaps even falling off the slide almost we have the case reports which may be the weakest or the lowest level of evidence but this is often the first sighting of disease and i think this is important as was mentioned this morning the recognition of alzheimer's was first mentioned as a letter to the editor so we have to realize that there are many things that really can inform science that come out of case report the lowly case report or the case series and case reports are the results of doing things. This is how we, we achieve sort of our, our fundamental need to take care of patients. Um, they're the results of the practice of the, the practice in the art of medicine with a keen eye for observation. This is following classically in the footsteps of people like Osler or Sydenham or Borhoff. This is how we discover syndromes and conditions. You know, the recognition of Kaposi sarcoma and immunodeficient state was first published as a case report in the MMWR. The association of FEN FEN with pulmonary hypertension was a few letters to the editor in Lancet. The discovery of Factor V Leiden came as a result of a hypercoagulable state recognized in a few hospitals in Leiden itself, which is how it derived its name. And of course, years ago, you had, or centuries ago, I should say, you had the recognition of smallpox and Jenner. And it's interesting, of course, that Dr. Singer mentioned the eradication of smallpox because I, I actually want to talk a little bit about smallpox and Jenner um, because I think he plays a role in, in what we're talking about now in some respect. Uh, Jenner recognized the clinical events and put them together with the known practice of variolation, which had been practiced for years, I mean, for hundreds of years before the common era. Um, but Jenner put this together with a keen eye of observation that milkmaids didn't get smallpox. So what he published was actually a case series of 23 cases, the first 16 of which were observational studies based on these, on these first 16 milkmaids. And then the last six, he actually used a method of inoculation with cowpox virus. So cowpox, um, vaca is cow in Latin, vaccinia is cowpox. And from there, we actually get the term vaccination because we took an inoculation from a cowpox 
and then we vaccinated people against smallpox. So it's interesting that you mentioned smallpox because with the, with the development of vaccines and the discussion of vaccine development, it comes down to actually smallpox and Jenner and how this came about. So I think case reports certainly have advanced medical awareness and knowledge, and I think they're, they have an important role. They could suggest pathophysiology or biochemical mechanism of a disease. They're incredibly useful in orphan illnesses, such as pulmonary hypertension, the rare side effects of medicine. And it gets the, the pros and the storytelling of the past were simply case reports that help describe all the phenotypes of a, of a disease that we la later went on. And to list other diseases that were first discovered this way, Legionnaire's disease, for example, West Nile encephalitis, graft-versus-host disease, oh, and just COVID. COVID was first reported as a case series of two to the WHO. So from there, you know, that was simply the beginning at the crest of a wave that is now crashing all over the world was the fundamental, it started fundamentally with the recognition of something new and the case report. But we really want to crave randomized control studies. You know, we want to be scientifically vigorous and we really want to have equipoise. So is it ethical to demand a randomized clinical trial if there is no clinical equipoise. Um, if we want to design such studies, sometimes we actually have to change the question to fit the mold and we end up answering a different question, not the one we want. So if you think about this description of the elements of a good study, the hypothesis must be an important and unresolved issue. It must be designed to provide evidence uh, to address the said question, be feasible, can be conducted with scientific rigor and accurately pour the methods and results in a timely fashion. Now, I might argue that researching the use of hydroxychloroquine in critically ill hospitalized patients was fairly timely addressed over a hundred years ago, but yet we went through it again. I could also say in my field of cardiology, there have been studies reported on the use of oral inotropes a full 10 years after the close of the study, which I think in any lenient say, um, would still not be considered a timely fashion. So certainly there have been flaws in how we've designed some of our clinical studies. So we have to weigh the benefits and burdens of our trial design and our trials indeed. You know, the benefits of these large trials are that they have public health and perhaps individual health benefit. But the burdens are that many people who need medications can't get to them. We all, I'm sure, have patients who needed hydroxychloroquine who couldn't get to it because of it. Um, and there are many small studies that are done, so our questions actually can't be answered properly because they aren't powered to address them enough. So if we look at just some of the studies that have gone on now for COVID, it's really mind-boggling what some of the, the drugs that have been trying to find a new treatment, how are we as physicians supposed to keep track of them or rank them, let alone patients? We have right now a pandemonium. And I think we have to be careful, and this is yet another aspect where in ethics we have to be careful about it, is that we have to worry about how they're presented. The public views case reports as sound randomized controlled trials, as strong in evidence as randomized controlled trials. You know, the, the announcement of the vaccine, while very promising, was not peer reviewed. Their data have not been reviewed. Um, the question is, was behind this, was this to boost up moral support for the fact that we have perhaps some dim flickering of light at the end of the tunnel, or was this sort of driven by politics and perhaps even monetary gain for the company? The, public, the publicity associated with trials and the results, new uses for old drugs and marketing, I think is one of the things that we have to make sure that we govern, um, or at least have a role in how that information is coming out there. I'd like to sort of show an example of, of what we also, I think, have to, to think about. And this is actually, I think this comes up with the whole idea of, of justice and equity, because a lot of the, the drugs and the trials that we're talking about are going to be available for a small fraction of the global population. So I want to look at some of the smaller studies, which are not class one tier randomized control studies, but sort of class three, class four tiers, cohort design studies, looking at old drugs. So let's take a, a look at an old friend. This is, you know, a role of ACE inhibitor, which of course, as a heart failure doctor, I find incredibly important. But with the press coverage about the role of angiotensin, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme and COVID and its mechanism of action, 
people stop taking these medications. So this study looked at what happened when people stopped taking um, ACE inhibitors, or actually comparing people who maintained their ACE ARBs in the hospital and those who didn't. And there was a 40% reduction in 28-day mortality if people continued the use of the ACE and ARBs while hospital hospitalized with COVID. For dollars a day, what a bargain, 40% reduction in mortality. On the public side of this, you know, one would think, okay, but take this further. So this was a case control, a case controlled study of 602 patients in three Belgian hospitals. The mean age of these patients was 83 years old, overall mortality of 16.5% for those hospitalized with COVID. High mortality, high risk people. They took 201 of these patients who were on statins when they came in, and they did propensity matching for age, sex, high-risk medical conditions. Given where they were, it's likely that most of these patients were white, uh, white Caucasians, um, but they looked at those on statins and then the use of ACE and ARBs, and you had a 28 adjusted mortality reduction of, again, 40%. Phenomenal. This is a case-controlled study. These are drugs that we have great familiarity with. We know the side effect profiles of ACEs. We know the side effect profile of statins. These are available for dollars a day for generics. And these are therapies that can actually attenuate disease. It may not be able to prevent it, but can attenuate it, can decrease mortality. And more importantly, I think might have a wider spread use in a global population if we're thinking about it. And I think part of what we have to think about in the research related to sort of COVID and ethics and other pandemics is how we can develop therapies that might have a global application and not just pertain to those people in the sort of developed world where we have access to things like ECMO and ventilators. Um, although it depends on where you are that those may not be there. So I think that we have come to a place where we have to have the public facing sort of sensible medicine and our role as ethicists is really important in this because even though medical knowledge typically doubles every two years, it's going much faster in COVID. But what's surprising is the typical situations, you have a delay of five to 10 years in the uptake of medicine and medical therapies. Now with COVID, it's sort of happening simultaneously. And we have to figure out how we could sort of not necessarily break it, but make sure we don't slide down the ramp into the crocodile's mouth. And should we perhaps think about every single patient being enrolled in a trial? And that trial may not be a formal drug trial, but maybe a registry or database trial. Think of how much we've learned with the Framingham database and other epidemiologic databases. Should we use this? Is this a way we might be able to look at the long haulers with COVID and just get everyone enrolled so we could follow things and learn from things and get signals of mechanisms of action? And I think that these are things which are not necessarily going to be driven by pharma, not going to necessarily be, be driven by, you know, NIH or NIH equivalents, but things that I think are equally important that we have to keep our eye on. Because the opportunity costs of the pandemic are really quite great. We have many, many studies of therapeutic of therapies with very little sort of collaboration and oversight or collection of data. So we may lose opportunities to think of or to recognize small signals that either have great harm or great importance that otherwise otherwise might be missed. So I think looking at, I sort of took this question to think about, you know, the, the pitfalls of research during COVID or during any academic is really what who gets access to the drugs, who gets access to the trials, or what trials get access to what patients and how we need to perhaps govern this in a more thoughtful way. So this is a picture of the Texas Medical Center. And as I said, at the Texas Medical Center, we have created a bioethics consortium. We have also now created a Texas-wide consortium um, where we have a week, a bi weekly meetings with people throughout Texas, looking not only at how we have hospital standards for crisis and contingency, but also for lobbying and whether or not we could affect policy change. And, you know, we have a unique legislature here in that we only, our legislature sits only every two years. This year they're actually sitting. And we have clinicians and ethicists at all of these institutions who are prepared to go to Austin if we need to try and appeal things to make policy changes to help with some of the inequities and try and address some of the 
sort of ethical issues that have been brought up beautifully this morning sessions and again earlier by my the speakers before me. So I think that we have many um, important things that we could contribute to. But while that is where I am now, this, this view from Rockefeller is still really where I consider home, um, having lived in Chicago for most of my life. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be back, even virtually. And um, thank you again for inviting me to speak. Savi, thank you so much. Um, I'm just wondering that uh, with you at the one of the largest cardiac hospitals in the world, um, if, if investigations of of cardiac issues related to COVID uh, are being considered there? Uh, they certainly are. I mean, they're involved in, in many of the trials at St. Luke's Texas Heart. Um, they're involved in many of the trials as they are at Bentop. Um, certainly a lot of the, you know, Columbia is doing lovely work. Pittsburgh is doing lovely work. Michigan's doing lovely work. There are a number of centers and um, it's it's interesting the, the collaboration and, and I mean, this one of the other silver linings of COVID is the fact that People are doing things on Zoom so much that it's very easy to have, you know, cross-country meetings or international meetings because people are so fast about with it now. Um, so I think that is really that that is a, you know a, a silver lining to this. And I can't believe I've only known you for ninety-six percent of your life. That's all. <laughs> uh, I, 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 your dad followed me as chief resident. Um, the year after I was finished. Um, it's amazing. Uh, thanks so much. We'll, we'll have you on the panel. Our, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Erin DiMartino, um, who's an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Um, uh, Dr. DiMartino uh, did her undergraduate degree at Williams College and her MD in residency at Dartmouth and then did a fellowship in pulmonary and critical care at Mayo's. Erin uh, was a McLean Center Fellow in 2015 and 16. Um, her primary research interests are in areas related to clinical medical ethics, including advanced care planning, surrogate decision making on a national scale, and health policy. Erin um, headed up a group of scholars from Mayo's and the University of Chicago and Harvard to write a powerful paper a few years ago in the New England Journal on healthcare surrogate state laws, the enormous differences among the states. Uh, Dr. DiMartino will speak today on the topic, Dispatch from the Front Lines, Balancing Personal Risk and Professional Obligation. It's a pleasure to uh, give a warm welcome to Dr. Erin DiMartino. Erin. Thank you, Dr. Siegler. First of all, I want to begin by echoing the messages of appreciation and gratitude for your mentorship and teaching this uh, army of clinical medical ethicists, of which I am proud to be a part. Um, that fellowship was pivotal in my own professional and personal growth and I am eternally grateful to you and to the McLean Center, the McLean family and the University of Chicago for the opportunity. So my talk today is a dispatch from the front lines. As you've heard in the introduction, I am a medical intensivist. I have been uh, taking care of patients. I actually admitted the first COVID-19 patient to uh, any of the Mayo Clinic health system sites back in March and um, continue to care for them, just came off a week attending in our COVID ICU. I don't have any financial relationships to disclose, but that doesn't mean that I'm without conflict. In fact, I think that my role as an intensivist and the fact that I am personally taking care of patients um, and, and the fact that I also am able to zoom out and look at things through an ethics lens gives me both a unique vantage, but also um, places me in conflict, especially when you think about my other primary role, uh, which is as a mother and the responsibilities that I have once I doff my PPE for the day and uh, resume my role at home. 
During today's talk, I'm going to be discussing professional obligations, both in terms of the loftier virtue-based um, obligations that we have as healthcare professionals, and then some of the more nuts and bolts real-world considerations. I'll be talking about risk then, um, physical risk, psychological risk, and even briefly touching on legal risk associated with being a frontline healthcare provider during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'll discuss different methods of mitigating and reconciling the risks that are faced by healthcare professionals uh, and to foreshadow without offering firm solutions, but fodder at least for conversation and for our panelists discussion later. And finally, I do wanna end with some comments on training during a pandemic, which I think is a highly unique um, topic worthy of its own uh, talk in and of itself, but at least some comments and reflections on training during pandemic. So to begin, professional obligation. Healthcare professionals uh, are described as having a duty to care. Most of us have made a voluntary commitment to enter a profession in which we care for other individuals. And we alone in society are uniquely positioned to deploy those skills and that high level of education for the benefit of others in society who become ill. We alone are the ones who have the knowledge and expertise and skill set to care in the way that is needed during the pandemic. Many individuals have entered healthcare because uh, they feel called to do so, though not all. And um, many individuals, including physicians, have taken an oath to uphold certain values. But it's important to note that not all of the individuals who are present at the bedside who are exposed to risk will have taken an oath and will have approached their profession in this way. I think particularly of the phlebotomists, the radiology techs, the nursing aides who are at the bedside with me when we're resuscitating a patient um, who may have a very different conception and set of, um, of reasons that they are present in the workplace that day. And I would add that whether or not we've taken an oath, the extent of that commitment isn't infinite. It, and in fact, it's quite individual. And I would argue even it's an existential question that a lot of individuals have grappled with over the past few months, particularly people who are serving on the front lines. There are also some much more pragmatic, real-world considerations um, to be mentioned when you think about professional obligation. And particularly, I think about my team. So healthcare, particularly intensive care medicine, is a team sport where every person fulfills a unique role. And if you turn to your right and you turn to your left and the skilled individuals you expect to be there are not there, the team doesn't function highly and it compromises the safety of the patient, but also of the entire healthcare team. In this moment, and even now in Minnesota, we are calling upon professionals to um, slot into different roles than they had previously filled. So outpatient nurses filling in in inpatient settings and ICU settings. And there are individuals who have particular skill sets that make them of instrumental value, um, kind of almost irreplaceable in a pandemic response or a mass critical care response. But um, we are also relying on individuals who have different levels of other skill sets and different roles who are stepping in to help out. I would mention too that there are some financial realities and other types of realities that confront individuals and um, will cause them to be at work potentially, even if they feel conflicted about being there and concerned about their own safety, where they don't have the financial security or otherwise where they can sit out, sit on the sidelines. So having talked about some professional obligations, let's then talk about personal risk to our bodies, to our minds, uh, and also to our families. This photograph was taken during um, August after a high risk exposure that I had at work. Um, it was after my first of three 
negative COVID PCR um, nasal swabs, but I was advised to physically distance from my family, including a son who I was breastfeeding uh, for two weeks, for 14 days. And that takes a tremendous toll and it also called upon uh, our family to make some um, very difficult decisions about the type of distancing that we were going to enforce in our house and how to handle those recommendations. I'll mention that staffing shortages are increasingly becoming a huge concern here in my part of the upper Midwest and throughout the country. And I've mentioned already this issue of redeployment. Um, it's important to talk also about personal protective equipment. Much has been written about the importance of protecting our healthcare workers with personal protective equipment um, and also different ways of mitigating scarcity, including reuse or um, flexing the ways in which we are used to using our personal protective equipment. We each carry with us visible and invisible risks in terms of our personal health status. For instance, I have colleagues who are in the early phases of pregnancy um, and whose pregnancies aren't widely known or people who have a vulnerable member of their household as I have had with an infant son at home. And it cannot be overstated that the risks here are very dire, they're serious. Risk of serious illness and death. Many of the initial um, individuals in the US who were stricken and around the world were in fact clinicians who were exposed through their work. I wanna spend some time on the psychological risk. So I can tell you that from the front lines, these shifting recommendations that we were, say, hearing about in the news feel very different when you are in the intensive care unit. And so when you report to work in the spring one day and are told you have to wear a PAPR or an N95, very high level um, protective equipment before entering the room of a patient, and the very next day, 24 hours later, when you are rounding on the same patient, you're told that you can wear a simple surgical mask um, because the CDC recommendations have changed. It feels very uncomfortable. And yet, as the attending physician, who is supposed to be an example of um, leadership and also stewardship, I have abided by recommendations around PPE, but I can tell you that personally, it makes you feel uncomfortable to have shifting recommendations within the same week caring for the same individual patients. Uh, and this is also borne out when you talk to people anecdotally about the decontamination processes that they go through as they leave the workplace in terms of showering at work or um, changing in the garage or things like that. Um, Adherence to different policies, it, it's useful to have protective policies, and yet at the same time, um, adhering to them can feel very uncomfortable. As we've talked about in other talks so far today, um, bending the ways in which we practice medicine away from autonomy-based care to justice-based care feels uh, uncomfortable and unnatural to a lot of us in Western medicine and is contributing to moral distress. We are isolated from our patients in, in many cases where we are discouraged from going in and out of the room often. So we're communicating with them maybe more often than we would normally by calling them on the phone or um, FaceTiming with patients who are not intubated. Uh, from our families, from coworkers who might otherwise be sounding boards and persons with whom we could decompress. And we are witnessing suffering on such a mass scale. Um, and we're seeing it firsthand. We're seeing those um, gurneys go down to the morgue at a clip that I have never seen before. And moreover, we are seeing the inequities play out just in the number of ICU patients on a given day who require an interpreter, um, changing demographics in our medical intensive care unit at a rate that is really alarming and disquieting. 
I know that we'll be talking about this more tomorrow. One of uh, the McLean Center law professors will be talking about patchwork, her work on patchwork liability protection. And so I won't dwell on this, but it's also worth noting that in addition to the other risks that I've touched upon, there are legal risks to being a frontline healthcare worker, both in terms of civil and even potentially criminal um, charges that could stem from the care provided during a pandemic, and particularly if it deviates from standard care. How do we reconcile these risks? There are systems-based approaches which can include protecting the workforce by providing adequate PPE, and then very importantly, when scarcity arises, having institutional or state level guidance about what to do. And so if there is a shortage, say, of PPE, then are healthcare providers still encouraged to respond to a resuscitation without adequate PPE? I would argue that they are not obligated and that endangers the population if they continue to rush into rooms in the way that we used to do in 2019. We need to provide adequate mental health resources for all frontline providers. And then there are different states and institutions that have proposed, and some with varying levels of granularity, different methods of prioritization for scarce resources, which can include mechanical ventilators or ICU admission, but also um, vaccine allocation or uh, novel therapeutics, novel antivirals, et cetera. And then as we've heard about more in the essential worker uh, health uh, workforce, hazard pay, and so incremental increases in pay. But it's really vitally important to recognize that none of these is um, a complete compensation for the level of risk incurred in being on the front lines. We each have to take our own pulse about our personal health, family health, uh, and obligations and our beliefs, and as needed, seek accommodation from superiors. Finally, just some closing remarks on training during a pandemic. It's important for us to remember that learners should be considered a vulnerable class, in particular during this pandemic. They have less experience. They're more prone to exposure. They may have a fear of retribution for declining to participate and have a limited amount of time to accrue knowledge and skills. And so it's important for us uh, to work with graduate medical education and medical schools to think about ways in which to include learners, but do it in a sensitive and empathic way to check in with our learners about their comfort and experience in caring for um, COVID-19 patients and offer reassurance and solidarity. And finally, I just wanted to close on a slide um, that in memory of the many, many healthcare workers who have lost their lives through their frontline experiences taking care of COVID-19 patients. Thank, thank you so much, um, Aaron, the, the, for that lovely talk. Uh, Professor Zoloff's interest focuses on the intersection of bioethics and religion, particularly Jewish studies. Um, Professor Zoloff is past president of the American Academy of Religion and the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities, the ASBH. Her work on bioethics in healthcare led her to serve on the NASA Advisory Council, the space agency's highest civilian advisory board, and on the International Planetary Protection Committee and the National Recombinant DNA Advisory Board, and the Executive Committee of the International Society for Stem Cell Research. Today, Laurie Zoloth will speak to us on the topic, Journal of the Plague Year, Ethics and COVID-19. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Lori Zola. Lori. Thank you, Mark. And I, I want to join my voice to the chorus of people praising you and thanking you for your extraordinary work in the program and setting up the McLean Center and really transforming 
um, this very special corner of bioethics by your work and your vision. Um, and it's, it's, it's long been something I've admired and respected even before, long before I came to Chicago. So I also wanted to say thank you to Mark who um, earlier this year, because after these conferences are finished, as you know, Mark right away starts to plan the next one. And I think it was in December or maybe early January when I said, you know, there's some, I want to give a talk about these cases that are occurring in China about this strange disease. I think that I think I'm worried about those cases and I want to give a talk about the ethics of this, of this new disease before it was named COVID. And, and you tolerated that um, quite well, actually, with that sort of like, oh yeah, that might be curious and interesting and then who knew? So here I am now talking about something quite different, um, the journal of the plague year. So, so I want my disclosures are um, I have no one pays me any money, but I'm on all these boards and and um, I am influenced by my colleagues on these boards. So that's my disclosure. Um, this is going to be a very brief talk. It's a hermeneutics, um, and it's going to consider one question about bioethics, how did we do in a time of plague as bioethicists? So instead of turning the lens on the external questions, I'm gonna turn the lens on ourselves to reflect on how we do as a field when confronted with the challenge of magnitude. And I'm gonna ask you to begin by considering Daniel Defoe. Now, Daniel Defoe wrote about the plague of um, his great plague of his, of, of his time when he was a child, 1666. And he wrote um, about it as an adult, reflecting on journals and records. The, the plague of six, 1666, an extraordinary bubonic plague. Um, he, the, the book, Journal of the Plague Year, was written in 1722. And it's his reflections um, as if he is there at the time, but there, of course, he wasn't there at the time. He was a child at the time. But it shows us some interesting things about plague. It's a, a book I think you should make the time to read. And here's the um, orders. He transcribes the orders that were conceived and published by the Lord Mayor and Aldermen of the City of London concerning the plague of 1665. Notice that the first thing they did was to appoint examiners in every parish. It was thought requisite and so ordered that in every parish there'll be one, two or more persons of the good sort and credit chosen and appointed to continue in that office for the space of two months at least. And if any fit person so appointed shall refuse to undertake the same, the said parties so refusing to be committed to prison until they should conform themselves accordingly. So everyone had to volunteer. Um, to be uh, an examiner, if you were a person of wealth, like as as the the protagonist of, of of Defoe's novel, and the protagonist of Defoe's novel says that he actually just served for a month. It was the month of August when the plague was at its height, and then he paid someone to take on his responsibility, but he didn't shirk the responsibility. An important notice: it, examiners were not the only people. These were the, the senior people of the city examining what was going on. There was a watchman appointed for every house where plague was found. There were searchers who were women who would go into these houses and check on people's status. The surgeons were forbidden to do anything but work on the plague. No other work, no, no elective surgeries. Um, there was a sequestering of the sick. There was airing of all the stuff after the plague had passed. They, um, not to the, so there couldn't be looting. Um, no one could leave the infected house. If someone was infected, it was sealed and the watchmen were put in front of it. And the watchmen were responsible for providing food. The city provided food. Now, as you can see, this is a lot better than 2020 and it's 1666. So that's just my first example, my first case study. And this didn't go well all the time. It was tragical, as Defoe said. It was authorized by law to be sure. It had the public good in view as the end chiefly aimed at. And in all the private injuries that were done by putting the rules in execution must be put to the account of the public benefit. So even though it ended tragically for many people who were trapped in these houses with sick people, everyone understood that it was the law. And even though Defoe says it's doubtful to this day whether on the whole it contributed anything to stop the infection because it raged with what he says greater fury and rage than the infection did, he still supported it in his, in his novel. He supports the use of these of these um, the city paid for, the, 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 the entire sort of structure of response was supportable and important, even though he's not 100% sure that it even helped. The next person we're going to turn to is, of course, Mary Shelley, beloved of bioethicists for her work on Frankenstein. But Fra Frank uh, her, the book that Shelley wrote on, on plague was a much more important book, one I 
I hope that you read sometime in the next few months before this, this, our period of plague is over. The Last Man is Shelley's masterpiece, really much more complicated, much, much more, much darker than Frankenstein, actually. And it takes up the same themes. What's the meaning of civilization? What's the meaning of social organization in the face of a disaster? Again, a disastrous plague that emerges from Istanbul and sweeps across Europe and eventually sweeps into England and eventually <laughs> kills every single person but one, uh, who is the last man. And here again, Shelley describes a society in which the nobles gave over their estates to be used as agricultural sites. The labor necessary to bring to the land this sort of culture employed and fed the outcost of the, dis of the diminished manufacturers. So here in this, in this um, example, in this excerpt, she describes how people, when their, the economy collapsed and the factories closed, everyone had to go to the land and they showed up at the land of the states and they turned them over to agricultural production. And it was hard. And yet to the honor of the English, be it recorded that although natural dis disinclination made them delay a while, yet enthusiastic generosity inspired the decrees. Again, an extraordinary response, social organization, primary. Now, of course, Shelley, um, um, also comments about the enor enormous importance of the religion of the plague and Shelley's um, bad guy in the story is a terrible leader, <laughs> a man who had in his early life lost through the indulgence of, of the father, um, all sense of rectitude and self-esteem and who when ambition was awakened in him, gave himself up to his influence unbridled by any scruple, sort of a familiar story for us as well, an instructive book for us to take a look at. After um, the, everyone is killed, everyone is dead, killed by the plague or other, um, uh, other injuries, or other mistakes, easy to make in a plague, in a plague time. Um, the last man just gets on a boat and just is gonna travel around looking for other survivors and read books in the libraries in every city that he comes to. Um, he is Verney, he is the last man. Uh, a very bleak story, but a story that's inspired by her commitment to the social organization that precedes the collapse of her civilization. And this is, of course, a story of her life as well. This is a picture by Robert Fournier. It depicts Mary Shelley, who's shattered in the in, way in the back there. Um, and in front, in the foreground, is, is Lord Byron, Le Hunt, and Furwani, three poets and writers who are in the foreground. They're looking at Shelley's body, which is burned on the beach. He, Shelley drowned after, um, he drowned in the Mediterranean after a visit that he had taken to Lord Byron. And they just, his body washed up. This is replicated in the novel itself. And she's gonna return, Shelley will, uh, Mary Shelley will return after this with her one remaining son after the death of five other children and several miscarriages and all the men pictured in the story will be dead um, of malaria or other actually infectious diseases. And Shelley goes back and writes this tragic story of the last man based on her own sense of incredible isolation. So a little moment of humanities here. Um, how do we consider these and what are these for? What do we teach these narrators? To give us, I think, some humility about our own situation. Because I think it's important for us to reflect on how our actions, not as physicians, which we're noble to be sure, as we just heard, our actions as moral leaders, how can you evaluate them against these accounts of other plagues in which moral leadership was offered and was nobly given? And these are questions, I think, of agency and authority and polity. My research, of course, just like everyone else's, and had focused on basic biological science and emerging technologies, especially genetic technology. And like everybody else, I turned my research toward COVID-19. Um, I was interested in how this disease particularly would affect the poor and the many ethical issues that have emerged during this pandemic. And because I think some of them are the most, the oldest and the most enduring questions of societies, how to have justice under conditions of scarcity, how to balance the power of the collective and the liberty interests of the individual, what are fair limits of research, what are the product, the product of research are part of the marketplace, how does that work? How should a society respond when the burden of disease falls disproportionately on vulnerable communities? Who should get access to vulnerable social goods when the choice is the choice between life and death? And the nature of the duties of healthcare providers when their own lives are at risk. We've seen all of this, people have noticed these same, the same ethical questions that I did. And these, of course, the cascade of questions about state and moral activity, scarcity, individual choices about mass, and you risk your life, all of these many things we've already spoken about, so I'm not gonna spend time because we agree, um, we agree that these are, are, are critical. We've all taken them up. And, but there's one more thing I wanna point out, and this is um, Siddhartha Mukherjee pointed out very early, May 4th in New Yorker, leave aside the wind-blown avenues of an empty, joyless city 
the generation defining joblessness that has shifted so many from precarity to outright peril, to what extent did the market drive efficiency obsessed culture of hospital administration contribute to the crisis? And here Murkerji points us to the, the very question that I'm thinking about. What have we done to make this crisis work? How have we collaborated to make this crisis work? And what's interesting is that it, it was something I think frankly disturbing about as early as March though, so March 11th is we all agree the key day, just really a week and a half later, we march right up to offer our ethical guidance. And it's not on moral activity or why we should, we, why we, we have to comply with public health. It's to allocate scarce resources. We were right there at the front saying, here's how we should allocate scarce resources. And we were also, but four days later, I won't say who wrote this, but another bioethicist, about how we can safely restart the economy in June, this is in March, and here's how, and had a cheery um, set of ideas about how to do it that involved workers and customers who have developed immunity going right back because they would have this, this immunity and they could go right back to restart the economy. And in this, in this, um, this opinion piece, a bioethicist argues that the economy is terribly important. We have to have the economy. It, it, it goes hand in hand with ethics as if the givenness of capitalism was the thing we had to protect as opposed to the health of the poor, for instance. Um, and I did the same thing. I made the same mistakes. I taught bioethics at the time and I was teaching a class. I decided to turn my class to the real time ethical challenges. And I created a little ethics lab. I wanted to do original research in the field by my, with my students. And since most of our research is done in, in, in humanities very individually, I threw the question open to my graduate students and my undergraduate students um, who were teaching, really, were thinking introduction to biology, bio, bioethics course about how you could consider the ethical issues of the pandemic as it unfolded in real time. And we focused on vaccines because we felt that the successful development of the vaccine historically is the most reliable way to protect populations, although of course not the only way. And as it was an unfinished project, they could do some individual research. And, um, and we went ahead and we did that. And I used a methodology of dividing the class up into, into libertarians, utilitarians, Catholic, Jews, Muslims, and Protestants. Um, and I had them off, scurry off and research their own textual traditions of each tradition, the original texts. And they interviewed university scholars. And then I wanted them to create policy based on these, what their particular moral location and make these appeals legible to a policy driven audience of non-experts. And they did that. They're University of Chicago students and they did it. And so we thought we had it nailed down. We knew how did the Jews think about things? How did Catholics think about things? And once again, we were wrong. Um, we got it wrong in quite the same way that the ethicists had got it wrong about allocation. Here, October, Haredi Jewish men bringing mass in Brooklyn, which really shocked me because if you know my work, you'll know that I was astonished because I've been teaching for years about how Jewish ethics works. In other debates, Pekuk Nefesh, for instance, have the overriding need to, to save a life guides every one of our, of our arguments about how, why we should go forward on a particular kind of research in a bit, debates around abortions or stem cells or organ transplants or gene drives or cloning or AI. We always say intervention will save lives. The sources say it's not only permissible, but it is oblig obligatory. Religiously obligatory. They also, we've I've taught the Dina de Mahuta Dina. The principle of Dina de Mahuta Dina means that for Jews, obedience to the civil law of the country in which they live is viewed as a religiously mandated obligation, and disobedience is a transgression not only of the civil law, but of the religious law. I've also taught that we don't like appeals to naturalness. Um, we know natural law, right? We know on paganism. And I've taught that, there's, we, that Jews do not think there's such a thing as unlimited liberty. Um, that Jews are not autonomous, that there's a very weak appeal for autonomy in the traditions and not even an unfit, no one is an unfitted individual and they're surely not free of community constraints. And I've taught that the world is broken and in need of repair and the Jews have a mandate to heal and are supportive of healthcare interventions. And yet <laughs> there they were um, reminding me once again of the big difference between theory and practice. So because to oppose the wearing of masks or the closing of schools or economies would normally be straightforward halakhic case, it just would be impermissible. And 
it's really interesting, even though very quickly Jewish authorities in the lay and rabbinic communities began to, to, to um, denounce these, these outbursts and to rein people back in, it still is an important phenomenon that shows how we had gotten far from, from some, of the, the, some of our communities. And by the way, it wasn't only Jews that, that acted um, with less nobility than one would want given our textual understandings. Christians began saying things like this all the time. One of my favorite images because what is this actually? It's Passover, right? So, all right. I wanted to ask this question. So I've gone sideways into it by showing you how other communities in, in, in previous historical eras acted in plagues, how we didn't, um, why our research might have been off, but here's my question to consider. And I want to leave this open um, for, for, for your discussion. Did the way that bioethics, is the way that the bioethics is constructed as a discipline limit our ability to offer serious moral leadership? And even, in fact, to get to the moral structures of 1665, where were we in, in that debate? Did our focus on autonomy, our, our autonomy, create this, this idea about what autonomy really was? Um, I became the person in Hyde Park <laughs> yelling at people to wear their masks, yelling at my colleagues, physicians and, and, um, and faculty members to wear their masks. And I was often told, mind your own business, as if the business of public health would be their own and I had my own, right? So this comes out of, what did this come out of our, our obsessive concern with autonomy? Did it come out of our focus on right space allocation systems in which people's qualities would be added up in a calculus? Did our definition of strong feelings of loss as moral distress, by the way, a brand new concept, um, did that keep us away from thinking politically? You know, that chart about the Kubler-Ross acceptance, I want to go back to anger and say, what was done to the American polity was wrong and we should fight it, not accept it. Where were we on that? Did the, but did our ideas about being sad get transformed into, into thinking about moral distress instead of thinking about an Aristotelian political response? Did our commitments to market-based libertarian systems of justice blind us to how these would play out. It's, when I teach, I teach systems of justice and theories of justice, it's really rare to see a system of justice fail so utterly as libertarianism failed in the face of COVID. But it failed in the face of COVID. Market-based solutions failed in the face of COVID. People did not take personal responsibility and act well and act decently. So Friedrich Hayek turned out to be wrong in this case. Did our embrace of utilitarianism blind us to what needed to happen, to the sensitivity of, the, or the, of, of, of what was happening in, in marginalized communities. What happened to, in, in our rush to a utilitarian um, allocation, which we did very happily and quickly and swiftly, though, as was pointed out, differently in different hospitals, did that blind us to the need for a preferential option for the poor, for example, or to an attention to disability? What about our idea of freedom? Did we allow this really tiny, chintzy idea of freedom, I am free not to wear a mask, um, um, blind us to the, the abundant freedom that Immanuel Kant really puts forward, when we, that we should teach, that we should know and promote, the idea of full human flourishing, to see it reduced to the cheapness of, I can't wear a mask, or I can carry a gun, is tragic to me. And does our trouble with naming practices as evil or even sinful, which we have such trouble with, like guns or vaccine refusal or Purdue Pharma, we have a hard time saying that's evil, that's sinful. We can't allow that, that is impermissible. In a way that, for instance, Mary Shelley or Daniel Defoe had no problem naming behaviors as sinful. So that's my question. And here's my further research is needed slide, which one always has. Um, should we turn instead to a rent how do we live in a tragic world, she asked, with decency and justice, understanding the tragedy that's not moral distress, but tragedy at the heart of our world, a broken and unredeemed world, actually. That shouldn't we read much more of Kant and ask the question for what can I hope and ask and learn more about human flourishing and teach more about human flourishing? Should we go with Hans Jonas and ask what sort of world do we create with our research? Or how about Aristotle or Maimonides or Avicenna? the three, what virtue should the work foster? Fidelity, veracity, and courage. Or of course, my friend, Emmanuel Levinas, who always shows up in these, in these talks, how does my duty to the other constitute my freedom? And how is my duty prior to my freedom? And finally, um, at this moment, this dark winter that we face, we should go into it really with, with um, Reinhold Niebuhr, who thinks 
always about tragic contingency and is useful in a situation such as this. Now, I want to say that the theories were not fully adequate. If these theories were not fully adequate, and if I think actually bioethics has some work to do about how we embrace these theories, I must say the practice of the physicians was a grand moral act in country after country, in system after system, in oppressive countries, in dem democratic countries, in countries like ours, which is like Lord knows, practitioners offered an example of the heroic nature of the work that is healthcare itself. And we should all learn from that. Daniel Defoe reminds us, I think it ought to be recorded to the honor of such men as well, clergy, as physicians, apothecaries, magistrates, and officers of every kind, and also all useful people who ventured their lives in discharge of their duty, as most certainly all such as stayed, did to the last degree and several of all kinds, did not only venture but lose their lives on that sad occasion. To the 922 people who died in the service, they're thanked not only by Daniel Defoe, but certainly by me as well. So my bioethics has some work to do. I think we should take some time and honor, um, honor those such men and women um, who stayed and did not flee. So thank you. Um, uh, Peter, uh, uh, two questions that, that have come up to ask you. In, in how many countries is the WHO involved in this pandemic? And secondly, secondly, can you describe some positive examples of national responses to COVID-19? That, that is, can you name a couple of countries uh, that have excelled in their particular responses to this pandemic. Sure, thank you so much, and uh, I'll be brief. I want to say I feel shortchanged, though, because I've only known you for fifty percent of my life, so that doesn't seem fair. <laughs> it just seems like yesterday, but it was thirty-three years ago that we were in the. Anyway, um, uh, so thank you very much for those two questions. WHO uh, is um, relevant to every country. It has Everything. 194 member states and its modalities may be different, but it's relevant to every country, including the United States. So, for example, in terms of its policy guidance, um, it's relevant in every country. It has 150 country offices, so it has direct support of governments uh, physically in 150 countries. But in the context of COVID-19, it's had surge missions into countries that have had hot spots, even in the absence of country offices. So. The takeaway message is WHO is relevant to every country, um, as, by the way, are the Sustainable Development Goals, and they're, uh, they're universal. And to go back to our inequity theme, COVID-19 has displayed the inequities not just among countries, but also within countries, and WHO is relevant to every country. On the second, uh, on the second question, which has to do with some national uh, good examples. You know, one of the parts of value of WHO is it's the, actually the only place that the governments of the world can all come together and describe to each other their good practices. So every Thursday, we have a member state session on, online, and often health ministers describe to each other their challenges, their successes, and so on. And that peer-to-peer -peer learning is extraordinarily important in terms of the uh, uh, epidemic. Of course, it happens subnationally as well, but WHO provides a platform for the uh, kind of government to government, country to country learning. In terms of specific examples, we published a series of videos actually, um, and you can find it on my Twitter thread. I'll, I'll retweet it immediately after this uh, thing as well, so it's more easily accessible at Peter A. Singer. Um, uh, but just a couple of examples are Rwanda and Vietnam were parts of that uh, uh, parts of that Twitter thread. You know what's interesting about some of the examples is um, that it turns on its head the notion that poor countries are poor and rich countries are rich. Some uh, so-called advanced economies or developed countries um, did not do so well. For example, if you look at it in terms of uh, mortality rate per million of population cumulatively since the beginning of the epidemic. Some so-called developing countries did extremely well. Some of the factors may be related to um, the muscle memory of having dealt with SARS-1 helped, I think, in, for example, many of the uh, East Asian uh, countries. Um, but also, you know, for example, a country with Ebola that has excellent contact tracing uh, or that faces recurrent epidemics 
um, and has well-developed contact tracing, tends to do well because contact tracing is actually, you know, isolating the virus, isolating cases, tracing and quarantining contacts. That's at the heart of the public health foundations of the response. So it's quite interesting how it's turned on its head the notion of which countries did well, which countries did poorly. And maybe, Mark, I'll just end with this. Um, you know, there's about a hundredfold difference in mortality rate per um, million population among even the G20 countries. It's really a hundred, a hundredfold, hundredfold difference in mortality rate per million of population mortality rates. So deaths per million of population cumulative since the epidemic, since the pandemic began. And um, that's a very large variation. You remember we used to talk about Jack Wenberg and, and area variations and it's the same kind of thing. And then you look and see, and some of the factors I talked about may uh, contribute to that. But if there's, if there's one factor, and uh, Thomas Boyke at the um, Council on Foreign Relations has done some very good work on this. If there's one factor that seems determinative, you know, what doesn't predict it is IHR capacity, because it's not what you have, it's what you, it's how you use it. So for example, there's a number of um, measures under the international health regulations, laboratory capacity, et cetera. That doesn't seem to be predictive. Health systems, universal health coverage, that doesn't seem to be predictive. What does seem to be predictive is trust that communities have in government, which is so interesting in terms of the soft uh, underbelly and the values underlying. This was a paper, I think, in Foreign Affairs, might have been Foreign Policy by Thomas Boyke recently. And so there's a lot more to understand and unpack there in those case examples and in that variation. And um, I think at the heart of this is, uh, is a potentially leadership, and which of course leads to trust between communities and, uh, and governments. And it's leadership at all levels from community activism right up to the head of state and head of government. So, um, you know, in summary, WHO is active in every country, not only has 150 country offices, but it's useful and supports every country, including the United States. There's a long history of collaboration between WHO and the United States that we could go into. It's very proud and long may it continue. And, uh, and in terms of the national examples, um, uh, I'll retweet that case series, but it really offers some very counterintuitive um, findings that are really, really interesting. And again, you see an ethical value, trust, at the center of, uh, at probably at the center of explaining what's going on here. And it's so interesting that values, ethics, those kind of soft infrastructure um, is the most explanatory uh, variable in the variation among uh, mortality rates. And, and the numbers speak for themselves. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Peter. That, that, that was wonderful um, and, and much appreciated. Uh, 192 in 12 countries with offices in 150. Uh, that, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah, 194 member states, yeah. 194, and, and in, including involvement of the U.S., which I was not aware of. Um, yeah, I, I, the U.S. is one of the 194. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm going I'm to turn now to a question that, that I'm going to direct um, to Aaron and to Savi and um, to Kelly. And, and it was, only, it was the, the, the last words that, um, that Lori Zoloth said, which picked up on among the, the final sentences that Aaron DiMartino said. And tell me if I have this right, that 922 U.S. healthcare workers have died in the course of the war. Did I get that sort of right, Aaron and Lori? Oh, I, I can't hear Aaron. That was from Kaiser Health News, and it was at, that was as of August 10th. So uh, one might imagine that number has grown. But I has don't, grown. I, I couldn't find more recent data. Now, there are three questions that were raised. Uh, Lydia Dugdale is the first one. But, but th these are three of the same questions. North Dakota is asking nurses to work while they are COVID positive, so long as they don't have symptoms. Is this ever ethically justifiable? 
um, th th that is b both at th the risk that it may cause to other health providers and the risk that it may cause uh, to patients themselves. So um, uh, who would like to start with that? Uh, Kelly, well, can, Savi? Can I just say something to, to clarify? I think what North Dakota said was that they would allow asymptomatic healthcare providers who tested positive to work. They currently aren't doing that. And there was a, a very good interview yesterday in NPR with one of the medical directors of one of the major um, hospitals in North Dakota who sort of laid out clearly that this would be sort of last case scenario where if you had no, you know, no one else, would they ask people to do this? And then you'd have to figure out how they would then interact with their coworkers who weren't infected. So while I, I, th I think that, I mean, the ethical issues of it, I think are, are, are you know, there's tons to be sort of deconstructed there, but they, they've given the sort of permission for it to be done. They are not at that phase yet. We may well see them if we believe, you know, Emily's projection or what Emily said about the projection of the surge not really hitting us or peaking till January may come to there. But currently they are not having positive asymptomatic people working. What, that's what's interesting to me is like, no, that's not ethical. <laughs> that, that should be easy for us to understand. And that's when I talk about you're not acceptance and, and, and there's moral leadership. It's not acceptable. Um, today, um, I guess over a thousand nurses in Philadelphia are out on strike, or Pennsylvania are out on strike, saying it's not ethical. And we should be leading them. Bioethicists should be leading this argument and not trying to fix up the little pot that we're given in the inadequate thing that we're given, but keep on fighting for a much bigger vision for what's needed. And that, you know, I mean, that, you know, that the lack of political demand is tragic. So that's, I mean, that's 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 part of why I'm I'm worried. About it. What is it about it that's holding us back at this moment, when we know better? We know that's not ethical, you know. Mm -hmm. We should be charge there, you know. I I, um, I even. Oh, I'm sorry. Please. I was just going to say that I think that this sort of reflects one of the challenges that we have in this country and what we were what we were seeing in chicago and this is this is kind of what i was trying to describe how can we um start to allocate scarce resources at one hospital if we know that in uh at another hospital some five miles or fewer down the road there's the resources that we need and this is where i worry about us as a country and how we can utilize our resources as effectively as possible. If there are many people, healthcare workers across the country who could help take care of those patients, we need a system that can help galvanize that effort and support sharing of resources rather than relegating some institutions to scarce resource allocation uh, that's potentially unnecessary. I think to that, extent. I mean, one advantage is about the VA system is that certainly when the cases were surging in New Orleans um, at the end of the summer, they're in the same vision, sort of the same region we are, and people and sort of hard, durable goods from Houston were redeployed to Louisiana, to New Orleans, to help with that. I mean, so the VA at least is a good model about sharing resources. But see, we didn't, it ended up happening was people who showed up, so if 150 people showed up at, showed up at a, at, in a protest, a tiny fraction of, of angry people showed up in protest, they got all the attention and people felt like, oh no, you have, to, you have to attend to their upset. And we were quite polite and said, okay, we'll help you organize this and help you divide it up. So I, I don't know how you enact that, but I know, it, 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 I know that Aristotle thought that ethics were political. And we have to think about politics and power if we're gonna, and, and take something that takes some leadership in the moral debate in this country. And I'm not sure, if, I think part of it was we were very busy with an election. So maybe now that that's decided, we should, um, we should take some responsibility for, for, for the kinds of, for naming something as ethical and doing something not as, as unethical and, and being bolder about it. Okay. Thank you. Aaron, you're close to North Dakota, um, uh, Minnesota. Um, is there some um, 
exchange of patients and, and of caregivers? Absolutely. There actually always has been. Historically, we've been a referral site for both North okay. and South Dakota. Um, so that, that remains. And uh, to the extent that good communication networks are available and that we can trade resources, I think that's supported on the regional level. The problem is that in our very own region, we're um, popping up ICUs and locations that uh, we never cared for critically ill patients before and aren't in a um, in an ideal situation to be to be reallocating in the region uh, regional resources to neighbors. I I I want to thank the five of you um, and Emily Landon who. Uh, is off to another meeting at the moment. Um, I think what we're going to do is take a 15-minute break before going into an additional uh, panel four on COVID-19. That um, Will Parker, who I think um, Aaron, uh, no, 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 I'm sorry, hey, Kelly, you, you've worked with Will uh, in the past, have you not? Um, yeah. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll be the moderator on that. Um, so, so let's gather again in, in 15 minutes. And, and my deep thanks to all of you for, for beautiful talks and uh, beautiful participation. Thank you.